Hi, and welcome. Max Mathias here. Uh, I apologize right now. I'm probably talking a little bit quieter than I normally would. That's because my son is asleep behind me, so I'm trying to strike a balance between uh, being animated and loud like I normally am versus not waking him up. So uh, apologies for that. So today we're going to talk about the production possibilities frontier. So what is it? The Production Possibilities Frontier, or PPF for short, you'll hear me call, uh, I'll be calling it that now from now on just because saying Production Possibilities Frontier again and again and again is a real mouthful. Basically, it shows you what a country can produce given its current factors of production. So factors of production is bold there. Why? Well, we need to talk about them, right? What are factors of production? So we generally think that there are three main ones. And uh, again, these are in no particular order, but we usually start with land. So land can be the amount of land you have. It can also be kind of the quality of that land. Another way of thinking about that is like presence of natural resources or richness of the soil if you're farming or anything like that. But right, you need some physical space to be able to produce things, uh, but also then what is in the land or the quality of the land can make a difference as well. Labor. When we're talking about labors, we're talking about workers. So it can be the amount of workers that you have in a country. The United States population, I want to say, is around like 350 million versus, you know, China, who has well over a billion. So just from that kind of standpoint, we imagine that, you know, China has more labor than the U.S., right? Uh, worker skill is also a thing, right? How educated your workers are. There's a whole bunch of factors that go into it. Uh, and then capital. You'll notice I put physical in front. When we talk physical capital, we're really talking tools, machines, general production technology. So anything from, you know, a hammer we would consider to be physical capital, it aids us in a tool, all the way to the most complex of machines that, you know, churn out, uh, you know, these products in mass, right? That is physical capital as well. Again, I'm putting physical there because what's important to remember here is what is not a factor of production, money, also called financial capital. So the idea is that physical, right, physical capital, labor, land, all of those things can be purchased with money, right? We use the money to facilitate these transactions, but money itself is not a factor of production, right? If I, you know, had a dollar bill right now, it, it can't be used to hammer a nail or go out and make something. It's used to help us, you know, purchase capital, hire workers, or go out and buy land, but it itself is not a factor of production. So that's really, really important to remember. Um, another thing to remember here is that the PPF is a snapshot in time, right? We're asking what a country can produce, holding things constant right now. So basically, what can we produce today? Uh, we're not letting these factors of production, land, labor, capital change. As soon as we start to change, the PPF changes. We'll get to that later. But the idea is, right, we're looking at what we can do right now uh, and talk about the trade-offs and things associated with that production. Uh, we'll let it change in the future. So let's go right ahead. Let's draw one. I'm going to choose pizza and beer. That is our classic economics example for getting uh, college students interested in this stuff. Obviously, you can choose whatever else you want. I actually had a story when I was a TA at UC Davis. I had a student come in and she was like in tears. And I was like, you know, what's wrong? And she was like, I don't eat pizza and I don't drink beer. So like, I don't know what's going on with the production possibilities frontier. And I had to be like, it's okay, right? Like you could choose whatever you want. I walked it through. We chose new goods for her and we talked about it. But I just thought it was really funny, right? We do pizza. We, we uh, do beer because we think that's what college students like. I don't know how out of touch we are, but uh, that's what I'll stick with. Just so the other economics teachers out there, you know, don't think I'm a hack. Uh, it's also important to know that countries obviously produce more than just two goods in reality. We're going to try and graph this like we do with so many things in econ. We're keeping it simple, right? Whether we're talking about two goods or a million goods, a lot of the intuition that we're developing today in talking about this applies to more goods as well. So here we have our graph on the right-hand side. Uh, I put pizza on the horizontal axis, beer on the vertical axis. You could swap those. It doesn't matter. I just put them there for fun. So let's go ahead and draw it. It looks like that, right? Uh, it kind of bows out. We're going to talk about the defining features, but the idea, right, is that that blue line represents the maximum a country could produce of those various two things in combination with each other. So where uh, that line hits kind of, let's call it the beer axis, denotes how much beer we could make if we only made beer, right? So all of our land, labor, capital went to producing beer, no pizza. The other side down where we're hitting the pizza axis, it's the exact opposite thing, right? We're only producing pizza, no beer. So let's talk about the, what I would consider to be the two defining features of the PPF. 
First is it's downward sloping. This depicts opportunity cost, right? So if you are operating what we'll say efficiently, and I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide, but if you're operating on that line, the idea is that, you know, if I'm somewhere on that blue line, if I want to make more beer, right? So kind of move up into the left, I have to give up pizza, vice versa. If I'm on that point somewhere on the line and I wanna make more pizza, I gotta give up beer. So opportunity cost, I'm trading beer for pizza or vice versa, that is uh, represented by that downward slope. If it was upward sloping, that means that we could get more of both and that we don't really think that's realistic, right? Econ is all about trade-offs. Second, it's bowed out or concave. It doesn't have to be this way. We generally think it is. Um, I'll do a trade video at some point, and there we actually assume it's linear. So that is called a constant opportunity cost. That trade-off of beer for pizza or vice versa is always the same. Uh, we think it's bowed out, right? Basically, this implies that there is increasing opportunity cost as we move towards an extreme. So as we get really, really close to making only beer, the opportunity cost of beer in terms of pizza I'm giving up is really, really high and vice versa. If I'm really close to making only pizza, if I wanna get a little bit more pizza, I gotta give up a lot of beer. So what this is basically saying is that inputs are specialized and we think that's pretty realistic as well. Some people or machines or you know land is better at making beer than it is at pizza. And those are the people that essentially we'd want to switch to making uh, the other good at the last moment, right? If I take that person who's a really good brewer and I force them to make pizza, I'm gonna be giving up a lot of beer. In doing that right and that's we generally think that happens only at those extremes where the curve is almost getting flat and when we're really close to making only beer or it's almost vertical when we're making only pizza so let's talk about characteristics of the ppf so here's our graph from the last slide i'm going to pick three points to basically talk about production levels what we consider to be efficient things like that so there's a green point a blue point and a red point the green point, which is inside that frontier, we consider to be inefficient. The idea, we can make more of both, right? We're not using our resources to the best of our ability if it's possible to make more pizza and more beer. How do I know that? I always like to think of basically drawing like an L on that line, right? So wherever point we choose, draw an L shape, like those arrows I have there, if we can move in that northeast direction, right? Making more of both. If it's possible for me to do that, then I'm not being efficient, right? That blue point, however, is efficient. If I wanna make more beer, say, I have to give up pizza or vice versa. So if you look, if I draw the L shape there, there's no way I can go up and to the right because at that point, I'm outside the graph, which brings us to the last point. The red point is unattainable, right? Anywhere outside that frontier, I can't produce there yet, right? And importantly, it's important to say, given our current factors of production, Maybe in the future, if technology improves, we get more land, we get more workers, whatever, maybe we can get to the red point at some point in the future, but not today. Okay, so anywhere inside the PPF, inefficient, right? By our summary that I knew I was getting to, just didn't click the button, inside the PPF, uh, right? That green point, inefficient, we can get more of both. On the line itself is efficient, even those extremes, right? Only beer, no pizza, that's efficient. Only pizza, no beer, also efficient as long as we're on the line. Outside the PPF is unattainable. So let's now talk about shifting the PPF, right? So what if I let those factors of production change? So starting with our PPF again, I mentioned earlier how we're assuming we're holding things constant. Let's let something change. So imagine that there's an influx of immigrants Therefore, we have more population, right? So labor has increased. So by this logic, labor has increased. We have more workers in the country. We should be able to make more than we did before. So how do we represent that on the graph? By a shift like this purple line. And again, it doesn't have to be an exact shift that looks like that, right? You could draw a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, as long as it's outside, right? So the idea now is that the area between these two curves, between the blue and the purple curve, are all now combinations or bundles that were unattainable before. They lied outside that blue PPF, but are now feasible. So the purple line is our new kind of efficient frontier, if you wanna think about it that way, right? We're able to make more of both pizza and beer than we could before. Now, if there was mass emigration, right? So people leaving the country, the population would decrease. Again, now here we would say, well, labor has decreased, we can make less than before. That's a shift inward of the PPF. 
So now the gap between the blue and that kind of dark green line are bundles or combinations of pizza and beer that we could have made before, but now are unattainable because we've lost so many workers, right? And so this kind of leads to a little bit of a tangent here, but economists generally are against things like brain drains, right? Countries that aren't using the most of their population, either not letting women work or decreasing education for women, things like that. To me as an economist, that is like anathema to how I think about the world, right? If you as a country want to be as efficient as you can, Educate everyone and everyone you can. Let them work. You can make more stuff and you will be more prosperous as a result. There's my quick little tangent. Uh, moving on. What if factors change that only affect one good, right? So if we have our pizza and beer PPF that we've been talking about, well, what if brewing technology improved, right? So something that only improves our kind of capacity to make beer, but doesn't affect pizza at all. How does that change the PPF? Well, Intuitively, we know our capacity to produce beer has improved. So basically, you know, where that blue line is hitting the beer axis now, we know the new one should be higher, right? We can make more beer than we did before. But if I went to the extreme of only making pizza, I wouldn't reap the benefits of this technology, right? So that pizza um, kind of, let's say, intercept, right, where the blue line hits that pizza axis shouldn't change at all. Because at that point, I'm not utilizing this brewing technology, so the way we would represent a graph that captures only an increase in brewing technology would be something like this. You'll notice the orange line is now higher for beer, but it's hitting the exact same line as it did before for pizza. But what you will notice is that now this area between the two curves, I can still make more of both than we could before. So these are kind of spillover benefits of brewing technology that actually do let me increase my capacity to make beer. And a way to think about that is that factors of production that could have been used for beer production before can be moved to pizza because of this increase in brewing technology. So maybe before I needed five workers to operate a brewery efficiently, now I only need three. So those two workers can go move to pizza and we're basically reaping the technology uh, gain from brewing and it's manifesting itself as an increase in production in both goods. So let's talk about the limitations of the PPF. So while we generally think the PPF is a really useful tool and that it conveys many economic concepts in a single graph, if you are taking a principles of econ course or have in the past, this is probably one of the first things you'll talk about. And the reason why we like to talk about it so early in the course is it talks about a lot of things that we care about. Efficiency, opportunity cost, factors of production, all of these are important economic concepts and the PPF includes all of them. However, it gives us no information on where a country should produce, right? The PPF is called the production possibilities frontier. It's not called the production, like let's say, I don't, you know, optimal frontier or something like that, right? So even uh, possible, what we would consider to be efficient allocations, like only beer, no pizza, or vice versa, they're technically efficient, right? I can be on that blue uh, line making only beer and no pizza, and that's efficient, right? And we call that actually productively efficient. But odds are society's not going to feel that way, right? If we were in a society that had all beer, no pizza, everyone would be super hungry, right? Thirst wouldn't be a problem. Also, everyone would be super drunk all the time. Not that that matters, but everyone would be really hungry, right? Or if, on the other hand, we made only pizza and no beer, everyone would be super full, but everyone would be really, really thirsty, Right. So there's no way that those extremes, while being productively efficient and they're using resources to the best of their capacity, there's no way that we think that's best from society's perspective. Right. And so if you've seen my supply demand and then uh, market equilibrium videos, this is basically where we lead to markets are the bridge that get us from this idea of what is possible for a country to make to ultimately what is optimal, right? What is best. And the way we think about that. Markets do a great job of allocating those resources through the price to ultimately get us to where society wants to go. So with that, thank you so much for watching. If you got anything out of this video, please consider liking and or subscribing, and I'll see you next time.